welcome to Redwood. Let's all stand as we begin our worship service this morning. So glad that you can join us. We're going to start off here by singing, Blessed Be the Name. All praise to Him who reigns above. Sing it out here this morning. Oh, Christ, be 
tells us, you may be seated, thank you for worshiping with us, that if we did not cry out, the rocks would cry out, and I absolutely love, love that song. Well, we got a few announcements here uh, today, I'm glad that you're here to worship with us uh, this morning, and kind of heading into what's supposed to be, right, fall months, and yet I think we're going to hit the mid-80s today, that's kind of just our area, and I love it, it's totally okay with me. Uh, Sarah, not, she's not in the nursery working with the kiddos, but uh, she wants, you know, like pumpkin everything during this time of year. But uh, it's great. But hopefully you are enjoying uh, the season. We've got a special afternoon planned if you would like to um, attend that. It is kind of a ministry involvement luncheon. And uh, uh, Satan is already fighting that. And you say, how do you know that, Ryan? Somehow, some way, yesterday, uh, we were here most of the day, and I think I left one of the fellowship hall doors unlocked. Uh oh, right? And so we had like these platters of sandwiches and all that made and came in this morning. Sarah and I were looking at each other like, uh, weren't there more platters than this? And then, you know, I'm starting to think, oh man. And sure enough, one of the doors was unlocked. So we've got, we wanted it to be a little bit nicer than it is today, but we have some sandwiches and then we got pizza. So we're just going to, we're just going to roll with it. It's going to be great and uh, excited about um, how uh, many are uh, looking to uh, just, you know, partner in uh, the church in serving, and I'm excited for that. He's also fighting with, like, sickness going around, and let's just know that, that as we try to mobilize and advance as a church, Satan's going to fight that, and uh, I'm thankful that he's 
uh, still on the throne no matter what. Something that did not make it into uh, the bulletin, but there is a sign-up sheet on the back table there. We're going to do our first kind of church golf outing. Uh, if you would like to participate in that, it's going to be on October 17th. Okay, that's, that's a Sunday, two Sundays from now. Right after church, we're going to uh, head up to uh, the Emerald Hills Golf Club, kind of up here in the hills, and it's a simple par three. You say, I've never golfed before. Uh, We can have a great time. It's just simply like a little kind of pitch and putt type of thing, and uh, it will be a a good time. And so if you want to participate that, there is a sign-up sheet uh, in the back. There's no charge for that, so um, don't let that be a hindrance. If you uh, would like to go, just to go for the fellowship, let's just enjoy uh, some afternoon and some good exercise because it is a little hilly, and it's great. Uh, But just plan for that. Next home group uh, will be on October 22nd. So we're taking two Fridays off of that home group, and then it will be again on October 22nd. Then you can see some November dates there. And then MOPs, Mothers of Preschoolers, coming up another ladies gathering if, kind of just uh, as the ladies get together on Saturday, October 30th. And then on the 31st, which is a Sunday, we're going to do an outdoor service. So we're going to have church outdoors. We'll have an 11 o'clock only that Sunday, the next several Sundays. We're still going to have a 10 o'clock, but we're all going to gather in here. There's going to be a uh, short teaching on prayer. Then we're going to pray. And then there'll be a time of extra fellowship before the church. So we're keeping with the 10 o'clock, but on the 31st, there will only be an 11 o'clock service. will be outdoors. And then to follow that will be a church barbecue that I am uh, excited about. We do that every year uh, during the fall season. Games for the kids, jump house, and uh, cornhole. It'll just be a great, great time. But I'm thankful that you're here to worship with us. Let's stand one more time and sing unto the Lord. Our God, think about the words as you sing this song. Right now, I saw the Spirit begin to work in you. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice.
bowed, your eyes closed. Take a moment, like we do every single week. First Peter chapter number three. Mike, thanks for thanks for playing the, the piano. First Peter chapter number three. And my my heart is just it's excited for excited for today. Um, I would ask that you all uh, pray for for me and Sarah. Uh, later this evening, we will uh, jump on a plane and we will embark upon a retreat that is with pastors and pastors' wives, and it's for kind of our our wellness and. Uh, there's probing questions, and it's just a wonderful time when you're with other people of your same vocation, and it's just multiple days uh, of that, and we've been anticipating it um, because uh, we desire many, many, many more years of, of service unto the Lord, and uh, COVID has not been uh, easy on anyone, um, especially our you know, kind of our first responders, those that are on kind of just the medical lines and all that. And we um, thank you for uh, your service. We have many in our church uh, that indeed are doing that. But I'll tell you from a ministry perspective, and, um, you know, it, 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 it's, been, it's been extremely difficult and uh, to be able to try to minister and to navigate the times, what to do, when to do it, um, and all of that. And so uh, I'm looking forward to this, but you please be in prayer uh, for us as we will uh, be red-eyeing. I'm not a red-eye fan, but it's just what it's had to be uh, this particular year. And uh, it starts uh, tomorrow uh, night and just runs all week. And so uh, you please be in prayer for us. We would uh, covet those prayers. First Peter chapter number three, we are in our series of Between Two Worlds. So it's been six weeks since we've been uh, in this um, book as we've kind of been going just verse by verse through it. And uh, we are kind of the subtitle is living in the world as we look to the next. So we are living now with a kingdom mindset. And uh, so this morning I've entitled this message and uh, we're actually going to be in this text for multiple weeks. The good life of the gospel The Good Life of the Gospel. Now, some might hear that title and think, hmm, stick with me, all right? Verse number 8 of 1 Peter, chapter number 3. It's been a while, but uh, this is where we left off. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous or kind and humble. Verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. But there is one little phrase in there that I would like to capture as we kind of springboard into this text for multiple weeks. I want you to look at verse number 10 again carefully. It says, for he that will love life and see good days. I believe we have in this passage a a marvelous discussion of the subject of living and loving the good life. I suppose everybody that is in here and everybody that is watching online and that will even listen later this week, no doubt we all would love to see good days. Everybody will say to me and I will say to others, have a good day, right? It's just kind of a part of our vernacular, the way in which we speak. Everyone wants to have a good day. Everybody wants to love life, to get out of to get out of life all that we possibly can. But I suppose that the title, The Good Life of the Gospel, sounds almost like a health and wealth type of message. And I assure you that it is not. Everybody, under the sound of my voice this morning, including even the one that is speaking, is pursuing the good life. The Italians used to kind of talk about the la dolce vita. It means the sweet life. But our society is the pursuit of living and loving 
the good life. That's kind of how we would phrase it. For most people, that means chasing things. It means chasing objects. And some of those objects happen to be people that are used for their own self-gratification. It means pursuing the good life via cars and houses and money, vacations, sex, drugs and, and alcohol, clothing, food, entertainment, sports, the perfect body, and you could go on and on and on with that. But the sad reality, however, is that is not the good life. You do not necessarily love life like that, if, and you do not necessarily see good days with that kind of approach, with the idea of a moment of pleasure, a high, a rush, all of that falls short of long-lasting, loving life of the good days, and it all does not satisfy the heart. A poet by the name of Charles Swinburne, he kind of sort of kind of sums up this kind of emptiness of trying to seek the good life kind of more just in things and in, 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 in getting stuff. And I'll be honest with you, it, it, it's very cynical. The poem goes like this, from too much love of living, from hope and fear set free, we thank with brief thanksgiving whatever gods may be, that no life lives forever, that dead men rise up never. That's kind of pitiful, isn't it? That's not Christianity. That's not to the truth about what we just sang. So I think we're all familiar, I think, with those kind of in our society who kind of seek this this sweet life who are seeking the good life. I think maybe you can even kind of go outside of our society and maybe see how other groups of people are doing it. But you also can learn from the Word of God and how, and, and, and even kind of pages of Scripture. You remember a man in the Old Testament, right, who pursued the good life in all of the wrong places? His name was, anyone know? Solomon. That's exactly right. Solomon, he had incredible wealth. He had houses, he had chariots and horses, he had, he had women and all the intimate relationships that that man wanted. He had land, he had power, he had fame, he had everything that people today would say, this is the good life. This is how you can really love life. If you have all of this, that is exactly what Solomon had. Even the queen of Sheba, who was no commoner herself, came to visit him and she was staggered with his wealth, with his power and his possessions. That in Scripture it literally says that she was left breathless. It literally took her breath away when she saw everything that Solomon had. Second Chronicles 9 says, In the meat of his table, in the sitting of his servants, in the attendance of his ministers, in their apparel, his cupbearers also, and their apparel. Kind of the lowest of people there, the servants, and the way that they were decked out in their apparel. And his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. In other words, she was, spe she was breathless. Like, oh, I cannot believe what this man has. But was he content? Did he love life? Did he, did he, was he excited about what he had? Did he really see good days? Did he really experience living to its fullest? I want you to listen to his own words, Ecclesiastes 2, verse 17. Therefore, listen to what Solomon says, I hated life. Because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. People in our society, they ought to listen to Solomon. He had it all. If he had been living in our day, he would have had houses, he would have had vacation villas, he would have had, he would have had ranches, he would have had a fleet of BMWs, a bank account, all of that. Any, any pleasures that he would have wanted, and he would have said, and I hate it. I hate life. He would have it all today. He would have his, as some coined, 
He'd have his best life now, as Joel Osteen says. And he would have said, I hate it. It's amazing to think about the fact that we're told that some of the some of the highest suicide rates in our country actually come from individuals that are over 60, who've after kind of uh, years, they've, they've not lived the good life. They've not loved life. They've not seen any good days. In fact, I suppose we could safely say few people, certainly in America, love life. Few people see good days. Few people have a good day, are content, fulfilled, are at peace, and are happy. But certainly we Christians should love life. We as Christians should enjoy its goodness day by day. See, this is the legacy that has been granted to the believer. But how does it become a reality? How am I to love life? How am I to see good days? Well, I believe Peter tells us here how to do that. He gives us some very simple, straightforward, and practical insight on how to love life, on how to see good days. The point of verse 10, perhaps, needs to be explained a little bit further before I actually dive in to verse number 8. I want you to look at verse number 10 again, please. For he that will love life and see good days. The word life here is the word zoe. Now there are two words in the Greek for life. One is zoe and the other is bios. So let me just kind of give us a little lesson here on the language here. Bios comes from the word that we get biology, which simply means the stuff of life. Living as opposed to dying being alive as opposed to dead. So the, the, the technical reality of being alive, that is the word bios, biological life. Zoe means not just life as opposed to death, like bios, but all the experience, all of the, all of the richness of really living. All that is the fullness of life. That, my friend, is the word that is used here. Those who want to love, not the biological reality that you are alive, that you exist, but who love all the potential goodness and the fulfillment that life contains. That's what it means here. And the word love there, it comes from the strongest Greek word to love. It is a strong-willed affection and desire. And what he means here is those who really mean to draw all there is in life out of their own fulfillment, he's saying these people really do love life. Not just the fact that you are alive, but the stuff that makes up life, that you will love it, that your desire, that you will love life. And then he says, and those who mean not only to love life is that they would also see good days, days that are meaningful, days that are beneficial, satisfying, not days that are empty, vain, useless, unfulfilling. That's what he's talking about here. So those of you who really want to love life, those of you that really want to see those kinds of days, Peter's saying, Here's the formula. And I suppose it would be safe to say that there is nobody here that does not want to love life, to see good days. But the question is, is how do we go about it? How do we go about hopefully our desires to want to actually love life, to make life count, for it to be beneficial to see good, good days. Where, what produces it, even for Christians? Well, the truth of the matter is I'm confident that many of us do not love life in the way that we wish that we could. There are certain elements in your life that you just actually do not love at all. 
there are Christians, strange as it may seem, who even take right their life. That's how much they hate their life. And I would say it is safe to say that many of you do not experience nonstop good days. So it is essential for us to stop at a point here and to recognize the interpretive point. And the interpretive point is, who is Peter writing to? Believers. Okay? So Peter, he, he's, not, he's not talking to, to the lost world that's saying, hey, hey, you guys have got it wrong. Here's how you really do it. No, his audience, his, he's writing to believers. And he's writing to believers who are suffering. Writing to believers who are probably looking around at their life in all directions and see anything but good days, that see anything but worthy of loving And he comes in and he says, I want to teach you how to love life. I want to teach you how to have good days. It is in the good life of the gospel. And so let's embark upon this, verse number 8. We're only going to look at verse number 8 today. we got weeks to come, okay? I'm I'm in no hurry. Hopefully you aren't either. If you wanted it all right now, you're going to have to come back for multiple weeks, okay? Verse number eight, finally, be ye of one mind. Be ye of one mind. So let's start off with this. You want to know how to have this rich, loving, good days of your life? We are to live in harmony with each other. We're to live in harmony with each other. Ryan, that that has nothing to do with cars and land. Nope. We're to live in harmony. The word here literally means to be like-minded. One mind, to be like-minded. Now, listen to me. For most of us, like-minded is what happens when you agree with me. Did you catch that? That's what most of us, that's kind of how we define like-minded. When that other person agrees with you, then hey, you know what? We're like-minded. But that's not what Peter has in mind. He's not calling us to agree on everything. That's not possible, nor is it even desirable. I'll be honest with you. Inside the church, I'll be honest, we, we disagree on many things. We could start a huge argument this morning if we decided that we wanted to fight over politics. How Christians should vote. The best Bible versions. Where to send our children to school. What shows to watch on television. Which clothing lines and styles are acceptable. How much How much of our money should we spend? Birth control, vaccines, acceptable amusements, our preferred worship styles. Wow, that's prevalent in churches. Well, I like it this. We could argue about that, right? Or what type of music you personally listen to, the books that we read, the best way to discipline our children, and so on and so on and so on. The list of things that we disagree on would honestly be super, super long. You know what Peter's doing? Peter is calling for unity, not uniformity. He's calling for unity, not uniformity. We do not agree on everything. And hear me, don't get all crazy. That's okay. See, we often think like-minded is as long as you agree with me. As long as you see it the way that I see it, as if somehow, you know, I understand every single jot and tittle of this word, and you have to follow every single thing that Ryan Johnson does in his life. That is crazy. Crazy. We're not all going to agree. In the early church, (laughs) they disagreed over eating meat that was offered to idols. They disagreed on, should we keep the Sabbath? What day should it be on? Should we be vegetarians or should we eat meat? What days and laws should we observe? Whether or not drinking wine was acceptable. And you can go on. In the early church, there was a constant. So disagreements in the church, there's nothing new. So listen, if, if, if we're wanting a perfect church... Uh, Mike's here, but some of our other leaders are gone, so I can say this, right? If you want a perfect church, this is not the one, okay? So, uh, sorry, this is, so there's going to be disagreements within a church. It's nothing new. We don't all have to think alike. We don't all have to act alike. 
but we do have to be like-minded. Hmm. That can only mean and happen if we all have the same focus. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said in Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The church is the body of Christ. And in Christ and with his power, we rise above the things that can so easily divide us. In Christ, we have a unity that transcends secondary issues. I want you to notice in my list, we're not anything, they're not the secondary issues on so many things. We're not talking about major doctrinal truth. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. We are all sinners, and there are a myriad of different things that we must align on. But we can disagree on many things and still live in a harmony with one another if we keep our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. We doing all right? Man, seeking the good life. You want to love life. Woo, it's not cars, it's not houses, it's not health. No, it's, we got to live in harmony with one another. Let me give you number two. We are to be sympathetic to each other. Sympathetic. Verse number eight, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Now, the, the word there for compassion is the, is the Greek word sympathes. Sympathies. So we get kind of the English word sympathy, but we didn't really start using the English word sympathy until the very, very late 1500s. And so there's, a, there's an idea of sympathy here. Here's what it means. It means to suffer with someone. Compassion or sympathy here is your hurt in my heart. Me feeling your hurt in my heart. It means to share in the joys and the sorrows of those around you. We must not be insensitive, callous, indifferent, or cynical about suffering that we see. Not long ago, I spent some time with a dear friend who had lost a child. And the husband remarked that other people have a hard time knowing what to say, knowing what to do. It's at times like as if Maybe we had a disease, they said. Old friends kind of sometimes they they stand afar off. And I, of course, I spoke into that and I was just like this. Sometimes we just don't know what to say. Sometimes we simply don't know what to do in an, in an arena like this. With that said, I've learned over the years that your words do not matter nearly as much is the fact that you cared enough to be there. Sometimes you don't really have to say anything. Remember last week, we're talking about through the life of Elijah. Sometimes you just say, hey, can I just bring a meal? I don't know necessarily what to say. I don't know necessarily the, uh, the, 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 the verses or the passages that are going to minister to you right at this moment, but can I just be here? Can I just sit by your side? Sympathy is not about your words. Sympathy is the revelation of your heart to others, feeling their hurt in our heart, and we are sympathetic towards others. Hey, see, it's not cars, it's not houses, it's not it's not power, it's not prestige. It's not that. It's living in harmony with one another, being sympathetic to each other. Let me give you a third one here as we move through this verse. We are to love each other as family. Look again, verse number eight, finally. Be of all one mind, having compassion one to another. Love as brethren. Now, I'm sure Peter felt this keenly, since his brother, Andrew, was the one that brought him to Jesus. The word brethren means to be born from the same womb. So we are to love our Christian brothers and sisters, <clears throat> excuse me, because we are all born from the same womb. Well, what, what is it? What? No, it's born again, right? We're born into Christ. Christ is born within us. We are born again. Now, I am the second of two Johnson boys. And growing up, we often bickered and we would fight. Sometimes those arguments would, you know, get to a little bit more than just words and things like that. That's what brothers do, but it doesn't have to be that way, but that's kind of the way it was for me. We're like now best of friends and it's awesome. It's great. 
But each of us knew that if one was ever being picked on or being messed with, they weren't only dealing with one, they were now going to deal with two because we had each other's backs. So sometimes you fight with your brothers and sisters, and sometimes you fight for them. As I've already said, Christians do not have to agree on everything, and we don't. You do not have to be like every Christian that you meet. Nor do you have to, can I say this? You don't have to always like like everybody, like be buddy, buddy, buddy with every single person that you meet, right? Sometimes it's hard, right? Come on. Okay, you don't have to confess your sin in front of me. I'll confess my sin in front of you. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes people make it hard to like them, right? But loving your brothers means caring enough to stick up for them when they need your help. Now, we've got some folks that are away today, but listen, the people that are in this room, we ought to have each other's backs. We really ought to. There ought to be a a love for one another. We love each other as family. Anybody messes with my brother, guess what? Now they're messing with two. We ought to feel that way. If we've got issues that are going on in our church family, this is a family, right? And we ought to we ought to have love for one another. Let me give you the fourth one here. We are to show compassion towards those in need. Finally, be of one kind, having compassion. Again, remember that it kind of comes from that word like sympathy. One of another, love as brethren. And then look at this word right here. Be pitiful. Now, the word pitiful meant something totally different than what the general understanding of that word today in 2021 is. Someone today would use that word and say, oh, that is just pitiful what they did, or that's just pitiful what was done unto you. However, it actually it's a compound that's made up of two words, and they mean good plus bowels. That's crazy, right? Good bowels. What are you all thinking about this morning, right? <laughs> bowels. Literally, that's what it means. The Greeks believed that the deepest emotions, that the deepest emotions of love and joy, hate, anger, mercy, and you could go on, that it came from the heart. It didn't, that it didn't come from the heart or the mind, but it came from the intestines. It came from, it came from the innards. It came from the bowels. We would probably say something today like a good belly laugh, Right? It just comes from kind of deep down within you. It's not one of those kind of <laughs> like when I tell a joke, right, and no one laughs. It's not one of those. Stop that. Whoever just did that. That wasn't a real belly laugh. Kidding. But that's kind of, that's kind of how we would, that's what, what, what we would say today. It's kind of a, a laugh is so both rare and good for the body and the soul. It's a laugh that releases endorphins into the systems loosening up tightened muscles and makes you feel good all over it's that type of thing when someone or you see something that just makes you die laughing right it's one of those like where if you're in a text conversation you don't just send a ha you don't send a lol if you really did laugh out loud who knows if you did or you didn't right it's just what we do now it's when you kind of get one of those those little meme type of things where someone's just cracking up right when it's something that's so funny you need to relate that it did something on the inside. Ryan, why did you say all that? Well, thinking about this, this is, he's calling Christians to have deep emotions for those in need. The word later came to mean courage. So here's the connection. It takes courage to have the intestinal fortitude to care enough to get involved in the needs of others. It occurred to me that it's easy to become numb to the suffering around our world. Do you remember the Miami condominium that fell a couple months ago and the just tons of people that were killed? Or just five to six weeks ago, the 13 Marines and the 60, I believe, uh, the 90 Afghanistans that were killed by the bombing? Or even just recently of the failed drone strike, right? Our news is constantly death in front of us, and so we become numb to it. We must fight against the tendency 
to pass by on the other side in Jesus' parable about the Good Samaritan. So I'm just going to pass by on the other side. We've got to fight that. Man, you want to have the good life? You want to love life? You want to have good days? Care about people. That's what Peter's saying. It's so beyond ourselves, right? Our world is so wrapped up in what we can get, what we could obtain. And Peter's saying, you want good, loving days? You live like this. You're in harmony with one another. You're sympathetic towards one another. You're loving others like they're your very own family. And then when you see a need in their life, deep down with inside of you, you feel it and it lends itself to ministering. That's the good life. It's the good life of the gospel. That's transformative. God will give you, if we will ask Him, eyes to see, a heart to care, and hands ready to reach out to the wounded of body and spirit. Then let me give you a fifth one here. Where to practice humility. Verse number eight, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one toward another, love as brethren, be pitiful. Again, you've got to understand that word. To, back then, it was just, it's from the guts. And be courteous, kind, humble. Now, this may be the hardest of all. It means literally, the, the, the word literally means that our mindset is to not rising far from the ground. This may seem odd until you remember that the Bible speaks of pride as being lifted up, Right? Lift it up. Humility is not thinking less of yourself than you ought to. You want to know what humility is? We don't even think of ourselves at all. We're not trying to kind of hedge bets with people. We're not trying to we're not trying to make ourselves look better in our conversations. No, no, no. We're just we're just not we're just not worried about that. What are we anyway? We're just formed from the dirt, right? Genesis 2 tells us that God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. God, remind, God, God remembers our frames in Psalm 103, and we are but dust. So humility is not making yourself look good or look bad while others look good. It's not about making yourself look any particular way at all. Humility means enjoying the freedom in God to come down where we ought to be. It's all good. We're not jockeying for position. So in the body of Christ, we're to, we're to live in harmony. We're to be sympathetic towards one another. We're to, we're to love like we're a family. We are to have these just bowels of, of pityness of, hey, you've got a need. If I can meet it, let me get down there with you. And then let me practice all of this in humility. See, when differences rub us wrong to where we get into arguments about things, guess what? We're not being humble. We're being prideful. And so when we aren't willing to help, when we have the capability to help, when the Holy Spirit is telling us to help and we're not willing to do that, guess what? We're standing afar off. We're passing over on the other side of the street. And so as I close here this morning, so we're kind of thinking about this first steps of how to live the good life, the good life of the gospel. Where do you see all of these virtues rolled into one? Jesus Christ. Who is the greatest living peacemaker? Jesus Christ. Who is the ultimate sympathizer? Who is the ultimate lover, kind-hearted person, and the humblest of all to where he would even be obedient unto death on the cross? Christ. See, Jesus was meek, and Jesus was lowly of heart, loving the unlovely with compassion that drew from his pity and his power to relieve. He was gentle with the fallen. He was gentle with women. He was gentle with children. He cared about the broken hearts and the broken lives and the broken homes. Even when they would not have him, came unto his own, and his own received him not. John 1 tells us he went to the cross anyways to remove the cause of their griefs. The real problem, right, was the sin and what was, what was um, that that's the real problem of life. 
and he was making their deliverance possible. Listen, this is to be the attitude of every Christian. Every Christian is to have the attitude of Christ. Remember chapter number two, right? He's our example. And then in Christ, in the Holy Spirit within us, his spirit within us, we actually have the capacity to live in the high, high, high standard of what he's called you to. A lot of times in churches, we like to focus on standards of the exterior. When Peter's like, man, let me hit your interior. And that is the highest of standards. To live in harmony. To be sympathetic towards people. To love like we're brethren. Born of the same womb, the word means. To reach down when someone's hurting from the depths of who we are and minister to them. That's what Jesus did for you if you're a believer. If you're a believer, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you. See, he wanted you to be able to live in harmony with God. And the only way that was possible was to remove your sin. And so Christ died on the cross. We give him our sin and we get his righteousness. Live in harmony with God the Father through Christ. And we have his spirit now within us. So you want to love life? You want to see good days? Have this attitude. You see, what you gain out of life is predicated on what you feel inside. It really does come from an attitude. And if the attitude is not right, life will not ever deliver what you want from it. It takes more than the right attitude, though. It takes the Spirit of Christ in you. And I'll ask you, do you know Christ as your Savior? Because what I just preached is only possible through Christ. Only possible. It's impossible to do it on our own. And so if you do, if you do have Christ within you, hear me. What I just preached is and can be a reality for you. Just got to allow the Holy Spirit to work. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior today, make today that day. Got all the time in the world after this service. Love to open up the scriptures and show you how trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Put your faith in Him, the finished work of the cross for you, really, for all of mankind. And you can trust Him as your Savior. Christian, how you doing? It's a heavy weight, but it's a weight that's lifted in Christ because His Spirit is within you. So we want this, we want this good life. We want these good days and we want to be able to love it to its fullest. Not just that we're alive, but that we can fully, fully love it and enjoy it and it'd be awesome. Guess what? It actually isn't about us. It's about others. And you will find fulfillment like you cannot imagine. And if you're trying to walk these steps, if you're trying to allow the Holy Spirit to work in this way in your life, you know this is truth. Because you can look back and you can see the evidence of it. And so if you are seeing the evidence of this in your life, be a sister in Christ, be a brother in Christ that speaks into someone else's life and say, no, 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 it's true. It's true. This is what God does in the Spirit. He works through you to the lives around us. Every head bowed, every eye closed.